Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is longtime listener, poet laureate, and Taya master, Anne-Marie Young. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And if you're in the U.S. like I am, uh, happy Memorial Day to all of you. Um, I have to admit, I was so relaxed on Memorial Day that I almost forgot that we had a podcast. But then I remembered because I have a little alarm on my phone that says, oh, we have a podcast. Oh, we have a podcast. Oh, right. Okay. And then I remembered I have a guest. I haven't contacted the guest. I better contact the guest. I reached out to the guest. He was there. So we have a show. This is great. I love this. And his name is Matthew Turner. And like Emery, he's also from the UK. He is an author. His most recent book is called Beyond the Pale. And he has been doing, Emery, what we talk about often doing. He has been pursuing what he loves. Isn't that great? Oh, that's wonderful. I love hearing stories like that. Yeah, yeah. Because we need to have more people doing that. But here's this guy who's doing, who's providing the example, pursuing, just doing what he loves. How did, how did that get started? First of all, Matthew, welcome to the program. How did you get started doing this? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. So lovely to speak to both of you and all your listeners. And writing is, well, it's been a journey shall I say, I always say if I'd spoken to, if I was able to go back in time and speak to like 15 year old me and say, one day you're going to be a writer, he would be just, no, dismissed <laughs> immediately. I, I wasn't a particularly strong reader. I didn't like writing growing up. I always struggled with language and grammar and, and speech a little bit in my young years. So I had this association from an early day that me and writing, they just don't go hand in hand. So I avoided it. But I always, at least now looking back, have realized I've had a very strong imagination. I, I love storytelling. I love to just allow my mind to wander. And it's something that I did as a kid, as a teenager, and as a young adult. And eventually, as I entered my early 20s, after a rough breakup, I turned to a journal to just get some thoughts from my head to try and better make sense of them. But it was during this time that I really realized, wow, all you can do, Matthew, is, is tell stories like that is where your mind goes. So I was writing in this journal and just automatically building a story. Wow. And within a couple of days, I had this idea for a book. I had no idea how to write a book. <laughs> I... <laughs> I love and it. Obviously, I don't obviously read books, but I wasn't a, you know, a passionate reader. So I was starting from one of the lower levels. You know, mm. I could write like technically, but beyond that, not much. So I just started to get words out of my head and put them down onto the page or onto the screen, if you will. And over the course of nine or 10 months, just about every night, I would just spend 15, 20 minutes writing. And before long, I had this, this first novel called Beyond Parallel. And I remember the very, very first draft was, must have been about 110, 115,000 words. Any writer will know that that is far too long. They'll be like, yeah, that is sometimes how a first draft goes. And I must have ended up cutting about 30, 40, maybe even 45,000 words in that initial draft Whoa. for the various rewrites and edits over the next six, seven years. And it, that's exactly what it was over the next six, seven years. It was just this comfortable little side project that I would turn to every now and again when I was bored of my job, when I was struggling with studying, when I was just feeling a little bit down or I just was inspired for one reason or another. I would go back to that book and I'd rewrite it and I'd leave it and I'd come back to it and leave it. And once I got to about 27, I decided I need to just keep this in the drawer forever and forget about it, or I need to commit to it and end it and work with an editor or pitch it to agents or do something with it. I didn't know what that something would be, but I went in research and I found this world of self-publishing and authors who had been building a platform online. I started to put my work out there in various writers' forums to get critiques. And they were, you know, they were eye on me. They were tough. You know, I had to develop some thick skin. But I also realized that it wasn't that bad, that there was a little bit of promise here. And with a little bit of hard work and a little bit of studying and working with an editor and all these various critiques, I eventually got 
um, beyond parallel to a point where it was ready to be published. And that was almost 10 years ago. I think it was 2013 when I published Beyond Parallel. Wow. So it's nearly been a decade. And that just sparked a bug then. I, once I published Beyond Parallel, I was like, well, I can write a book. I want to do more. Mm -hmm. I to my second novel, my third. I wrote a nonfiction book in and around all this where I interviewed lots of people. And that was very interesting because I developed a bit of a love for interviewing people and hearing their stories and trying to turn them into stories sure. of their own rights. And then in the most recent one, Beyond the Pale, which you mentioned at the beginning, which is a fable, so a bit of a blend between my loves of fiction and nonfiction. So to say it's been a journey is exactly that. I've been a writer now, like I, I classify myself as a writer now for about 10 years. It's approaching 10 years to the day, actually, where I can probably say, yes, you are a writer. Like I left my job to like commit to this. But there was nearly 10 years before that where I was just wondering and just trying my hand at it and just writing lots and lots and lots and doing a lot wrong and finding a little bit right. And these days it's, it's very much my everything. I don't just write for myself, but it's how I earn a lot of my money through clients. You know, I ghost write for them and write books for them and articles and all sorts of things. So yeah, it's been a wonderful journey. And had I said, if, had I tried to predict this at 15, I would not have predicted this. <laughs> That's <laughs> fabulous. Well, I, I realize we also have something in common because you started seriously from your perspective being a serious writer. Uh, almost 10 years ago, I started a podcast almost 10 years ago. So we pretty yeah. much started around the same time, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah. But when you, when you do something like this, well, first of all, when, when you start off and talk, talking about how you, um, you were never really thinking about yourself as being a writer or much of a reader, but you were thinking about yourself as a storyteller that really resonated mm -hmm. with me. And the reason it resonates with me is because, well, first of all, everybody loves stories and we tell stories all the time. We tell it here on the podcast, we do it in our conversations, we do it in our social media, we do it all over the place. But secondly, because storytelling is basically how we document our lives. Yeah. And that's essentially what you, I think you were doing. I mean, you didn't really say it that way, but I got the impression that, especially in the earliest stages, when you were writing the first few bits down that led to that first novel, you were basically writing a story for your life. Yeah, and whenever I write a book, there's always a part of me in the lead character. I've never like written a book about my journey per se, but there's always mm -hmm. parts of me in it. And the one thing every single book, all five have had it, had in common is I wrote them because I felt the need to write them. I mm -hmm. wrote them because I had some kind of question or curiosity or something that I wanted to explore. And I find it easier to digest all that information and to figure out what is blocking me or like what is beneath that surface by writing a story. Some people do that through art. Some people do that through music. Some people do that from speaking to somebody. Some people does do it through numerous other things. For me, it's by literally creating stories. And it allows me to disassociate myself from it. It allows me to remove myself from the situation and go, okay, I'm going to write about what's on my mind, but I'm not writing it as Matthew. I'm writing it as, in the case of Beyond the Pale, Ferdinand, the lead character. So I'm able to use Ferdinand as a vehicle to ask questions that are on my, Matthew's mind. And I've always found that easy to explore a subject and digest a problem. And a lot of the times just tackle a problem, something that I may be a little bit too scared or uneasy to tackle mm. as myself. I use it as a kind of an avatar and a, a split personality. Emery, as he's describing all this, I'm thinking about uh, you being in the early stages that you're in of, of uh, basically being a poet and doing your mm. poetry writing. And I'm wondering, is what he's describing, does it resonate with you in terms of what you do with your process when you're writing? <laughs> Uh, yeah, if I'm in the zone, I can just like literally write and write and write. And then when I read back, it's just like, did I write that? But um, it's interesting that like, you're kind of saying you're not making it personal because you're you're writing your feelings, but in, in in out of somebody else's view. My fear, which I'm working on, is actually my books are children's books. So it's only like two thousand, two and a half thousand um, words long. 
but it feels incredibly personal and it's getting through that of, of giving my writing out and taking that personal out of it. But yeah, I just love the fact that you did the journaling. I love journaling. I love writing my feelings. I love writing poetry and just getting it out there. It's just a beautiful expression of, of what you feel, what you see, what you experience. Yeah. I totally relate to that. Yeah. And I bet, I mean, you just said it very, it's, it's difficult to get those personal thoughts out. And I struggled with that for years. Mm. I don't struggle with it so much anymore. I mean, I still do with certain things which I struggle to, to write about, but, um, but it's easier now, but simply through trial and error and through practice and yeah. perseverance. I think when, the more you do anything, the easier it gets. It never gets easy per se, but it gets easier just through pure repetition. But yeah, writing beyond parallel, it felt very raw and I felt very vulnerable and fragile, especially mm. when it got closer and closer to release it to the world, I found, I felt a lot of anxiety, partly because, you know, I wanted it to sell and I was worried whether it would achieve certain things. And again, I've learned to let go of stuff like that more in recent years. But it was just this idea that something that I wrote, even though I wasn't writing as Matthew, it was clear to anyone reading that there's going to be elements of Matthew in it. And you're placing yourself out there in the world to strangers, Mm. friends, family alike. It's, it's hard. And it still is hard. And I still have that anxiety when if it comes around to launching something big and personal. Even if I'm just launching something big and personal, like something silly like Facebook, it still has that raw emotion to it, that, that fear. But it does get easier. And it's one of the great things about writing. And I think all forms of expression, because once you find a way to express yourself, you can just turn to it as often or as little as you like and you can just use it as this vehicle to just get stuff out there and sometimes it makes you feel a lot better other times just a little bit but it just helps you just get through what you're going through and yeah i've personally found it easier in recent years to to kind of let go of the words and those feelings and just allow them to be what they need to be with the reader whoever it may be I also went through the process of writing a one novel. That was probably my only one, but I did go through that process. And when you were talking just now about the vulnerability piece of it, I, I don't think I actually verbalized it to myself that way, but that is exactly how it feels. You're putting this thing out there and it's, it's really a reflection of yourself, no matter what it is, no matter what you've written, it's a reflection of yourself. And so now you get all the questions coming to your mind, like, well, what if nobody likes it? Yeah. And what if they think I'm an idiot? What if the story doesn't make sense? You know, what if nobody reads it? Oh my God. Or what if they do read it? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's the big one. It's like, what if it's actually become popular and liked? Yeah, right. And everyone's going to be asking me questions <laughs> and everyone's going to be actually asking me whether this was real or was this for me? It's, oh, wow. It's, it is, it's hard. And any form of expression is, is hard. But at the same time, it's also beautiful. And it's why I think we need to always just take a step back and, and respect a person's art form and expression. You may not personally, you know, attach yourself to something like poetry or art or music. You may not particularly like something. It may not relate to you or speak to you. But the fact that there is a person behind that thing, whatever it may be, that they have quite literally poured their heart and soul into and they have more than likely used it as this way to express themselves and to get things out of their head that they don't understand and go through that process to better understand it. There's something special about that. And I think as a society, we need to do a better job of just respecting it and appreciating it and giving people kudos for whatever it is that they create. I totally agree. Yeah. In fact, I would say that it's not just in the area of creative endeavor, although I could also argue that virtually everything we do is a creative endeavor, but putting that little argument aside, uh, no matter what field we're in, no matter what topic we're, we're about, any time that we are putting ourselves out there through what, the way we express ourselves, so what we think, through what we feel, we are putting ourselves into a place that our society generally doesn't encourage us to do. 
Yeah. Most people don't feel encouraged to put themselves out there in that way. And so it's uncomfortable. And because it's uncomfortable, we don't like it so much. But then again, that's where the growth happens. And I think that's probably, for me, that's the biggest message that I got out of writing my novel was I did a lot of growing that I didn't really expect to do. Yeah, well, I mean, the name of the book right here, Beyond the Pale, is exactly about that, this idea of going beyond the comfort zone, going beyond your pale, because mm -hmm. that is where growth resides. It's so easy to say, and in theory, it's so simple, but the reality of it, taking that step, stepping into that unknown, it's terrifying, but it's also exciting because you know that that is where growth is. You know that is where the next chapter of your life is. Mm -hmm. Without doubt. And that was my question was going to be to you a minute ago was just like, OK, so you've got your vulnerable writing. You've got your book. It feels really raw. How did you feel when you'd done it and it, you got it out there and you started getting your feedback? How, how did you feel? Every kind of emotion, like, obviously, <laughs> in the beginning, I found with Beyond Parallel, the first novel, I experienced too many highs and lows. So every little bit of negative feedback I took to heart mm -hmm. and every bit of positive feedback I took to heart. Yeah. And I think that's a very dangerous path to tread as any kind of creative, not just a writer, but any kind of creative. To be honest, it extends beyond creativity. The creative it does. Space. Business, anything, you know, mm -hmm. we need to be somewhere in the middle. We need to appreciate that when someone gives us praise and in the case of a book, you know, that glowing five star review where they're like, this is one of my favorite books. This really changed my life. That's beautiful to hear as a writer. You know, I've had the fortune to have like some reviews like that. And it's like, wow, that's, that's amazing. That's lovely. But I try to read it and then go, okay, move on. <laughs> and it likewise, when you read that one star review, which pans you, it hurts for a few seconds, but sure. then these days I try to go, okay, let's move on because you cannot express yourself if you're thinking too much about other people. Yes. If you're That's worried about what people are going to think, whether you're trying to write something that they're going to love or not write something that they will hate, you will end up just stifling that genius within you. You will end up trying to back yourself into a corner you don't want to be backed into. And especially with, you know, me, like I say, I write every book based on something that's going on in my head, some kind of question or curiosity or wonderment. If I'm thinking too much of other people, then I'm not going to give that inner voice any stage whatsoever. So in the beginning, I got too high, too low. And over time, again, through just repetition, I've learned to be a little bit more just with the flow. I read a good review, it makes me happy, and then I leave it. I read a bad review, it makes me unhappy, and then I leave it. Because whatever happens, good or bad, you've still got to wake up the next day and get back to work. You know, if that's working for a client, whether that's working and like getting the kids ready for school, whether that's working in like writing your next book, researching the next book, whatever it may be. It's not to say we shouldn't use other people's feedback as, as what it is, feedback. You know, I've learned a great deal from certain reviews, you know, especially sort of reviews from writers and editors and things of that nature. You can learn a lot, but you've constantly got to filter it out and go, okay, well, did this person not like this book? Because it just wasn't speaking to them. It just wasn't their style, in which case that's fine. Or did someone really love this book because it was just the book they needed to read at that particular time, which is great, but that's not necessarily going to be everyone. So he'd always got to come back to like, is there something for me to learn from this review? Is there something for me to learn from this feedback? There always is to an extent, but a lot of the time you just got to let it go. You just got to get back to work and get back to doing what you do. It does raise a question case, though. Oh, go ahead, Amory. No, I was just going to say, and then in that case, every little bit of feedback, feedback or criticism, good or bad, whatever, is a gift because you're going to learn yep. from it and you're going to grow from it. So it's just viewing it like that and not taking it personally, because like you say, your writing is authentic. And if it doesn't come from you, it's, it's, it's not your story. Um, and everybody's different. People like different things. Some people are going to like it and some people are not. So yeah, I totally understand that. 
I like to look at is like every one of these little instances, especially adversity, but you know, the good stuff too, but it's like, it just adds a layer of skin. Mm -hmm. You know, we always talk about as writers, as creatives, business owners, we need to develop thick skin. Well, every one of these instances does exactly that. It puts a layer of skin over you, you know, it numbs you a little bit. So the more positive reviews you get, like you hear it, but you don't let it affect you because you know that as wonderful as it may be, you know, it can alter how you write or it can alter how you, you know, do you still got to come back to like, this is me and my journey, my story. I've got to go through the process, whether I'm getting good reviews or bad reviews, you know, I've got to dig deep into what's within me. I've got to commit to my cause. I've got to have belief in myself. And the more you put emphasis on what other people think, the harder it is, I think, to, you know, truly believe in yourself. You're constantly going to be, you know, looking out there for validation, for inspiration. Whereas as a general rule, most of us need to be looking in here for those things. It does raise an interesting question though. And the question is when you write, are you writing for yourself or are you writing for your reader or are you writing for both? It is a good question. Yeah. And it is a fine balance. And yeah. it's why I'm not even going to pretend like I know. I mean, <laughs> fine balance. It's, it's, it's so tricky because for me, there's two kind of books, right? There's a lot of books out there, which you know that they were written because they served a very simple purpose. Mm -hmm. They're a business card, they're a vehicle to get more speaking engagements. I'm not a massive fan of it, but I'll leave my personal opinion to one side. You know, <laughs> I, I hold, I hold the art of books, uh, you know, very close to my heart. And I feel like there's too many books out there that don't need to be written, but by the by, right? So there are those books. And if you are writing a book like that, I think it's less to do with what you have to say and more writing something for the person that needs to read it. But there's still an element of you need to write something that's unique and from the heart. But it's more swayed towards who you're writing it for rather than who the, is the person writing it. But then there's the person, and a lot of novels fit into this category, although not all novels, because there are plenty of authors out there who write particular niches and they do it because they know it's going to make money and things. But a, but a lot of novels and a lot of, um, you know, in my opinion, like the really, really good nonfiction books where you can feel the heart and soul inside it. It's got to start with the writer and they have to be, you know, very passionate about what they're writing. They've got to be speaking from the high. It's got to be a book that they need to write. And if they have that, they still need to take into account who they're writing it for. You know, there's like a, a book marketing canvas that I will always fill out before I write any kind of book. And it takes into account like, okay, who is this reader? Who, who do I need to write it for? Who's the type of person that's going to get the most out of it? What sort of situation are they in? So I'm always like coming back to that as I'm writing my words, you know, as more so not while I'm writing, but as I'm rewriting, as I'm looking back, it's like, am I expressing this in a way that is going to speak to, you know, that person? But if I'm thinking about that person too much, that inner voice isn't going to get to do what it needs to do. So I've got to allow that to roam and just allow it to do its thing to get those words on the paper. And then as you're rewriting and editing, you're constantly keeping that ideal avatar in mind and thinking, am I telling the best story I can tell in a way that is going to speak and trigger and inspire and open the eyes of that person? But for me, a book needs to start with a writer. It needs to come from somewhere of need rather than, I think this is going to help me, you know, get more speaking gigs. But hey, that's just my opinion. No, 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 your your opinion is perfectly fair. And and I'll I'll tell you what, you're making me, not making me, but you're encouraging me to kind of think back to what it was like when I was writing mine. I wrote mine just after the financial crisis, and it was set in a financial crisis for that very reason. And and I'm, I'm remembering a, a lot of the emotions that were attached as I was in the process of writing it. Um, I was trying to get a a uh, a message out to the population about how a financial crisis comes about. I, I know a lot about um, monetary policy, so I was trying to turn monetary policy into a novel, which, by the way, is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Let me just tell you that. Uh, just lay it out up front. This is probably the hardest thing you'll ever do. But, but the funny thing is that, 
I, it didn't take very long. I'm, I'm going to say I was like partway through part one of the first draft when all of a sudden I, it was almost like I was leaving all that stuff behind and I was just totally enthralled by what the story was going to be. Yeah. And, I think and, that's and, a good sign. Well, yeah, I think it is. I mean, Personally, I think the, the the story actually came out pretty good. Um, obviously, my readership doesn't tell, tell the agree because I didn't sell all that many copies, but that's okay. You know, the main thing is it was working for me. And for those people who did read it, I got reviews, so they liked it. You know, that was good. Uh, but really, I mean, I raised the question earlier about are you writing for yourself or are you writing for your reader? And even as I asked the question, I knew I was writing for both. Yeah. I, I, could, I, couldn't, both. yeah. I couldn't make it just about one. It was not possible. There was no way to make that happen. And if I, I knew if I had tried to do that, if I tried to write just for the reader, I would have lost interest really quickly. And if I just tried to write for myself, I would have lost interest pretty quickly. It wouldn't have worked either way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think it is. It does need both. It needs a balance. And I think that's the trick. That's why it's a hard question to answer because everyone's balance is different. Mm. Um, you know, some people will need to get a book out because they need to get it out. But they still need to think about, okay, what message is it serving? Who is it serving? But if all you ever do is try and write a book that is going to be popular because everyone's into vampires right now, then you're not going to hit the mark because you'll have missed that, you know, that sort of trend. So it is a balance. For me, I, I think it starts with something that you need to get out as a person. It's a story that you just want to tell. And then while, while you're going through all that, you need to constantly bring it back to like, okay, who, who needs to read this book? Who is this book going to speak to? And if you get to the end of it, the first draft, the rewrites, the edits, and you have something that you truly believe serves both, for me, you're onto a winner. And that's all you can ever hope for as a, as a writer. Unfortunately, the outcome is out of our control so often. Some great books don't get read as much as they should. And some mm -hmm. rather mediocre books go on to sell millions of copies. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. The way of the word of mouth can be a strange <laughs> little mistress. A lot of the times we can't control it, but we can control the thing that we write. And that's for me the most important thing. Now, of course, the big portion of all this is the storytelling. And... In storytelling, we are tapping into something that is universally loved. Everybody loves stories. But I, I'm going to ask us to kind of delve into that topic a little bit here. And I'm going to do it in a very broad way. Matthew, why do you think we love stories so much? It's quite literally in our DNA. Um, I mean, if you think about it, the Internet is like it's, it's a recent invention, right? Mm -hmm. So everything that we know and hold dear to our, in our lives today we can just, with a few clicks, clacks of the keyboard, get pretty much any answer to any question via a wonderful place that is Google. Go back 30 or 40 years, you could go to a library and get not every answer to every question, but you'd be able to find out a lot. And you then would be able to visit different libraries and bigger libraries. But even if you think about books, and you think about uh, in relation to human history, it's still just a click of a finger. Yeah. Just a few hundred years old. Before books, a bit of scripture, but not a whole lot. But as a human race, we've been around for tens and tens and tens of thousands of years. And civilization as we know it have been around for thousands and thousands of years. So throughout the vast, vast majority of our history as a species, we have passed on information through word of mouth. And usually it would come in a very sort of tribal sen setting where the elders would tell stories to the youngest. And some of these would be very literal stories, trying to paint a vivid picture to try and get people to avoid particular places that were dangerous to avoid particular foods, particular plants, particular animals that were dangerous. Some of them were very literal like that. Mm -hmm. Rather than just telling a kid, don't pick up that berry because it'll make you sick. We all know that you build a story out of it because it will create a bit more of an emotional attachment. But more importantly, it's easy to remember. And that's really what it comes down to. Stories are easier to remember than facts. And then we took this and started to 
bridge together tribes into grander societies, again, through storytelling. So early religions and, and gods and mythologies and everything, it, it was done to try and get people's points across, to try mm. and come up with some kind of collective ideas. But again, you can't do that through facts. You do that by making these stories and characters and bringing them to life. And the elders and the magical storytellers would be some of the most important people in that particular tribe or community because they have the power to literally pass on knowledge, to literally pass on wisdom, because you couldn't read about it. You couldn't watch it. You couldn't hear it. It was you had to hear it from the person's mouth. So the person who could do it in an engaging way, the person who could make it more vivid, more interesting, they were the people who were getting listened to. They were the stories that would pass on to the next tribe and the next tribe. And those were the stories that brought multiple tribes and communities together into cities and towns and civilization as we know it. So when you add generation after generation after generation, there's, you know, this power of storytelling like baked into our, our DNA. We have it on a very fundamental level that we trust stories. You know, if you think back to your childhood, <laughs> Your parents, your grandparents, your older siblings, aunts and uncles, they'll have told you stories. They'll have read from books, sure, but they'll have also told you stories just to calm you down, mm -hmm. just to, you know, keep you excited. So we have it all built in through, you know, millennia of interactions, but we also have it built into our everyday from a very young age because every generation has this trust and affinity towards storytelling. So the older you get, and as you move into school, and I'm, again, I'm imagining every single person listening and watching this, which was the teacher that you remember the most from school? Which was the lessons you enjoyed going to the most? More often than not, it was the person who had the ability to engage you. And how do people engage people? Through stories, through anecdotes, through jokes. Whereas the teacher who is maybe very good at their subject and knows absolutely everything they need to know, if they're just doing it in a monotone way, reading off one fact after another, after another, you may remember it until you have to take the test. <laughs> you don't remember that teacher 20 years from time. Whereas that mm. teacher who told a story, that teacher still pops in your head from time to time. Sure. So it's all about stories. So they play an absolute fundamental role in not just our lives, but humanity. And one of the big reasons why the human race, like uh, Homo sapiens became the dominant factor of this planet is through the development of language. And it was language and storytelling that kind of combined and interwove with one another that allowed us to then become, you know, 7.5 plus billion people, you know, a hundred, some thousand years later so we owe a lot to language but language without story doesn't go very far so as much as we hold uh, a lot for language we need to probably hold as much towards storytelling because language would have died a death i feel if it wasn't the story well i mean language wouldn't even become language as we know today without stories i mean how many words in our exactly. our entire vocabulary derive from stories and you know the first word that comes to my mind is enchantment where does enchantment comes from it comes from stories about witches and wizards you know i mean that that's you, you don't have enchantment outside of stories that's where it comes from but we have taken that concept and we have brought it into our everyday experience through the stories about witches and wizards same thing can be true of, of a whole list of other words that are part of the language. So, uh, yeah, I think storytelling actually is what builds the language. In fact, it I would is. say yeah. without, without, without stories, the language, the, the entire English language would probably be about one third the size of what it is, maybe even less. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think it would have built traction in the way that it did because no. in the same way as maths serves a function, but is difficult to comprehend for many because it's just data. And language on its own as just letters and as words, it's just data. And it's difficult to comprehend and to process data. Storytelling creates patterns. So just you can start to create patterns true. with that data. And that is what allows you to pass on information to others. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to retain that information from others. So storytelling is, is huge. 
it is one of the key, if not the key building block of the entire human race. Mm. And yeah, the next time you're wondering like, why do I remember certain stories? Why do I feel compelled to certain stories? It's because it's, it's an innate, innate thing. Like you are quite frankly born to love and trust stories. And that's important because we gravitate towards things that we trust. I, I was just realizing something uh, that one of the things that I've liked to talk about in various contexts over the years here on the show is just how easily we are drawn into um, focusing our attention on stuff that we don't like so much on negatives on, on, uh, I mean, and, and you look at the, uh, the English language as a whole, if, if, if you're trying to do things to kind of get yourself from a negative mindset to a positive mindset, you find all of a sudden that your vocabulary is drastically reduced because you eliminate, you know, like 80, 90% of the English language. It all has negative associations. And what I just realized is, well, that's because so many of the stories are about these conflicts that have gone on because that's what the basis of a story is, <laughs> right? It's about yeah. the conflict. So of course and, you're well, going to have all this language that's going to be driving how the conflict works. And there's the other interesting thing about it, okay? So this is why it's so innately built into our DNA. We are, quite frankly, like story generating machines, not necessarily on a conscious level, but on a subconscious level. So from a very young age, like a baby is an infant, you're, again, the world is just throwing data at you. You know, sounds, colors, things, passing by, blurs of light. And from an early age, like I have my youngest daughter is four and a half. So I could see her doing this while she was a baby, but also like one, two, three years old. There's just too much data mm-hmm. around them for their little brains to comprehend. Very powerful little brain, but it really finds it difficult to, to take it all on board. So how does it start to process that data? By forming patterns yeah. and by building narratives and by building beliefs and creating these stories in your head. Again, not on a conscious level, on a subconscious level. And it's these that so often develop into like limiting beliefs. So for instance, many people might have a limiting belief around money. They might struggle with money. They might think like money money is the root of all evil. And when they reverse engineer it enough, they kind of have like glimpse of memories of, I remember seeing my parents argue a lot over money. So I developed this association that money is bad because it made my mommy and daddy cross. And then every time I saw some kind of conflict, I started to associate it to money because I associate people who are having conflict and arguing with not having enough money. So you start developing some kind of block with money, whether it's always wanting more or fearful of like keeping it or whatever it may be. And again, it's because as young kids to try and make sense of the world, all that data we start to form these patterns. And how do we form patterns? Stories. And they become beliefs and they become, well, actions based on those beliefs. So stories are, honestly, they, they are like a fundamental building. But when I say it's like in our DNA, I don't know if it's like literally in our DNA from a scientific <laughs> perspective, but from a very sort of figurative aspect, like storytelling is like in our DNA, it's there on a conscious and a subconscious level. It's there to help us make better sense of the world around us and it's there to help us better learn from other people around us and it's there for us to help teach others i'm realizing also we have a golden opportunity here because we have an expert who's our guest in how to be a storyteller and Anne marie is also a storyteller in her writing (laughs) and i tell stories every week that i every day that i do interviews here so we're doing storytelling all, all over the place here but one of the things that we do talk about here is if you're trying to get that positive mindset, you're trying to make changes in your own life, changes for the better and so forth, you need to change your own stories that you're telling yourself to others, you know, the, the story lines that are dominant in your life. And that's a challenge for most of us because most of us never really develop the storytelling skill. I mean, it's not like we can't ever tell a story. Um, on, on the most rudimentary level, any of us can tell a story. But when it comes to telling a story that we can start engaging ourselves in and engaging others in and feeling great about, that's a different kind of animal. So from the point of view of somebody who professionally writes and tells stories, how can we develop the storytelling skill? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, in terms of like sharing it with others or the stories that we tell ourselves? Both, really. Yeah. I mean, I think it comes to uh like good tor- storytelling for me it begins with like creating texture if you will like you're trying to create these visuals that don't literally exist 
you know, they, they don't exist in a way that you can like show, not when you're writing or telling a story as such anyway. So you've got to try and paint those pictures through words. So you've got to start being more conscious about the types of words that you use. I mean, you mentioned it earlier, if we're going to focus on the, the negative uh, monologues that we have, so often it's negative language that comes into into the equation so to help tell better stories we need to be more conscious about when and how we're using those negative words and try and bring in more positive words which are better when it comes to like showing you know it's all about showing i mean as any writer will know it's all about showing rather than telling telling is a very passive way to like tell a story it's i did this i was sat there whereas you can bring it to life with more active language like sat there looking out towards the ocean i felt the experience of the sky around me as the w clouds wisped in and round in circles so you can tell a scene or you can show a scene and if we want to try and tell better stories to ourselves, we have to try to show ourselves better stories by replacing negative language with positive language, by being more conscious of the way that we're, we're um, showcasing and demonstrating and constructing the scene. And that's true whether you're say, you're telling someone else it through you know, a conversation or writing it down on the page, because it's all about engagement. It's all about triggering some kind of feeling and emotion. And you don't do that through telling, you do it through showing. So it's just adding texture to the situation and it's using words to add that texture. I'm hoping that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, right? I think it does. <laughs> As you were saying that, I also realized that a large portion of it is about being uh, uh, this is almost the wrong word. Uh, uh, assertive is the word, but by assertive, I mean making assertion rather than negation. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we, we might actually tell a story to each other uh, in terms of negation, but the good stories are told assertively, meaning here, yes. not, not here is what didn't happen, here is what happened. Not this is what I, I didn't want to happen, this is what happened instead. Not that I can't believe this person did this terrible thing, but rather I was really glad when this other thing happened. It, it, it's turning the language around to expressing the story from a viewpoint that is a different one from the one we're normally used to dealing with. That I think is probably the biggest challenge with the storytelling. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, whether, you, whether it's a story you're telling yourself and we're talking about like limit and beliefs and mindset, whether it's you're trying to get a message across to someone else, storytelling is a way to get a message across. So the message is, if we kind of keep using this uh, analogy, like is the data. Storytelling is the way to form patterns. Because it, once you form a pattern, you're giving it a better opportunity for it to stick in that person's brain. Or it's giving it a better chance for it to stick in your own brain. So if the message is dull and all over the place, and goes from this way to the next way and it's a little bit bitty and like you say it's like it's kind of this and maybe this happened it's going to be more difficult to form a pattern out of that you're not going to capture it in your attention but you know it's not going to be as engaging so storytelling is a vehicle to like bring a bit more clarity to the message mm -hmm. through something that's concise through something that uses rich textured language that brings it to life by, um, you know, saying it in a way where it shows rather than tells, by bringing a little bit of energy and raw emotion into it. And by just forming a more cohesive pattern, the best stories are the ones that have a nice, beautiful, cohesive pattern. At least the most memorable and easy to remember stories are the ones that form a nice, pieced together little pattern. You can have great works of fiction that aren't very good in that sense, but they're difficult to remember because they're so long and one, one way. They're very good technically. They're very lovely from a, a literature perspective. But in terms of like a story that you can pass on and that is memorable and you remember like six months time and you can almost like see the, the scene in your mind because you can still remember reading the words mm -hmm. on the page. Those are the ones which have the nice type patterns. 
So that's what storytelling is. It's trying to just form a pattern out of the data, the, the message. And whether you're trying to tell yourself something, whether you're trying to tell someone else something, that's really what it comes down to. Now, there's a whole art form that goes into forming those nice, neat patterns, and they can come across in so many different ways. We right now on the call, we have, you know, like a writer and a poet, you know, how I would go about it would be very different to how Anne-Marie goes about it. And it would be very different to how you would go about it in your writing, I imagine. But in essence, we're all trying to do the same thing. Take a message, create a pattern around it so that other people can remember it, feel it, be triggered by it, feel engaged by it. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the whole purpose of it. And you use the word clarity, which is a favorite word of mine around here. <laughs> and, and I love that because what you're really saying is I mean, we, we talk about clarity in terms of we want to achieve clarity, um, in terms of our, our own goals of, of achieving growth in our life, creating abundant lives for ourselves and so on and so forth. Um, and, and in the process of creating that clarity, we know that we're going to get ourselves into a place where we're able to receive that stuff and bring it into our lives and create it and, and enjoy it and, and get the most out of it. But you were also describing it in terms of the storytelling process that in fact, the storytelling process is about creating clarity. And, and that just kind of reinforces for me why we all need to be better storytellers because among other things, it helps us grow ourselves just because we're able to express things clearly, not just to others, but to ourselves, we are able to create our own stories in a way that is more clear. Absolutely. And it's also one of the hardest things to do. Um, hence why Beyond Parallels first draft was like 150, <laughs> 120,000 <000 laughs> words. And it's why writing the first draft is one thing, but then getting it to a clean draft ready for publication is another, because the job of the rewrite and the editing is to get that good idea and clarifying it because as a first draft it's not going to be quite clear enough so you've got to work hard to make it clear you've got to work hard to make less more and the same is true whether you're on a stage to form a speech to an audience the same is true whether you're trying to rework your mindset and tweak some kind of habit or belief it's one thing to come up with an idea and to tell yourself a story. It's another to then create something clear from that. And that takes repetition, that takes trial and error, and it takes a lot of hard work. And in my experience, it's never easy, whether it's trying to do a book, an article, a speech, a speech to out there to others, a speech in here to me, it's always hard. Mm, yeah, I think that's true. This is really... Very, very interesting that we're exploring this. Um, the, the name of your book is Beyond the Pale. You described it as a fable. And as I was thinking about what you were just describing about how you dis discover the texture of the story that you're trying to put together and how to, how you try to find the pattern behind it and so forth. I was thinking about Aesop fables because we're all very familiar with Aesop and whenever I even think of Aesop fable, one fable comes to mind that everybody knows the tortoise and the hare. And you don't even have to say anything more than that. You just say the tortoise and the hare, and everybody knows the entire story. It's an, actually a very simple story. I mean, there's, there's really not a lot of scenery. There's not a lot of plot. There's not a lot of characters. There's not a lot of conversation. But it's a complete story that we all remember. Why do we remember it so easily? Um, a nice tight pattern. It's clarity. It's taking the message, data, and in this sense, since, you know, this kind of philosophical and existential thing that we all need to, you know, appreciate that sometimes taking your time will generate more, you know, don't rush yourself. It's a very simple message to get across. But again, the whole point of a fable is to try and get that message across in a pattern that you can so easily pass on to other people and so easily remember yourself. So if all you ever say to someone is like, you shouldn't rush because of this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, people are going to forget. But if you create a nice story around it, like the tarts and the hair, then it's got a chance to be remembered because it's a story. But again, a story on itself isn't enough because that story then needs to be clear. It needs to be simplified into its essential ingredients. 
So yes, a story like that is simple. It feels so simple. I imagine writing it and creating it wasn't as much. It probably went through various iterations because getting something clear and concise is not easy. But when you get it, when you do it right, the tortoise and the hare is a perfect example of what happens because you take a very important message that is relevant to every single person on the planet. It's a very important human aspect of living that we all need to appreciate. And as you say, you don't need to even know the story word for word. As soon as you say Aesop's fables, you think tortoise and the hare. And as soon as you think tortoise and the hare, you think about the message behind it. Ultimately, sometimes taking your time wins the race. And you can start to make that relevant in your life, in work, in play, and whatever else. But that doesn't just happen. That's taking a message, building a pattern around it, and condensing that into its key ingredients. And yeah, it's a perfect example of a story done right. And I think it's also an example of, of a story that uh, basically molded itself over time through the telling. I don't think it was yeah. just Aesop who, I, I don't know what Aesop's original version looked like, but I'm no. suspecting that what we know of the Aesop fable today is probably modified, probably even significantly from what the original one was. I would imagine so. Yeah, I, I would be very surprised if not. And again, that, that's the whole point of it, right? It takes mm -hmm. time. It's not easy to make something concise. And yeah, chances are that fable has been, you know, perfected over many, 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 many years through many, 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 many different eyeballs going at it and just reducing it a little bit, you know? It's like uh, when you're cooking a lovely sauce. You can rush it, right? You can <laughs> rush that bolognese sauce by <laughs> taking the lid off the pan and putting it on like you're burning the <laughs> hell out of it. You know, it, it's still a sauce, you know? It's still a sauce. It'll do the job. It'll, uh, it'll, it'll cook faster, right? But you know, if you want a delicious sauce, you've got to let it simmer and cook ever so slowly. And it's got to just do what it needs to do. It might take an hour, it might take two hours. Same with me. You know, you can just throw it on that grill and just burn the hell out of it. And it's going to still be edible. You can still eat it. It'll be fine. It's energy, it's fuel. Or you can put it in the slow cooker, marinate it over many, many hours. To drag it out over a two, three, four day period perfect it and, and it's worth it when you do something like that it tastes better you remember it like sometimes you'll be able to close your mind and like remember that sauce or remember that lovely bit of meat you know because it was worth remembering so it's exactly the same with a story a story rushed just thrown out there it gets the job done maybe for a little bit but the ones that last the test of time they've been slow cooked you need to do it with love. Got to do it with love. Yeah. Nana, Nana's love. And she's still. <laughs> Nana, <Nana's laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true. I think that is true. It's also a, an example of the importance of anticipation, too, because when something is slow cooking, you smell it and you know it's there yes. and you, you become more and more aware of it over time and the awareness builds and builds and builds and then it starts to smell really good and you can hardly wait for dinner and it just keeps building and build. and you haven't even served the darn thing yet <laughs> extra adding texture to the experience adding texture to the situation um there's an art form to it there's an art mm. form to it in cooking in baking in writing in music in painting in, in everything. Even in the commercialized <laughs> worlds, they recognized it because they, they, they create movie trailers. That's what a movie trailer is supposed to do. They, they kind of compact it really tight so it's almost too yeah. too tight to actually enjoy it. But that, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to whet your appetite. And the ones who are good at it are really damn good at it. Yeah, they, they, they sell <laughs> lots and lots of tickets through a they really do. great trailer. And if you take something like Marvel, they, they drip feed trailers at certain mm -hmm. times releasing specific information at specific times to build, like you say, that anticipation, the experience, the texture. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a fascinating subject to kind of like rabbit hold it to go down. 
it's not just true in writing, it's true in, in most things in, in life, uh, in, in the personal world, in the working world. It's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It really is. And, um, yeah, it's hard to really kind of condense it down into like, do this and it will all be fine because I don't think that secret ingredient exists in the same way as there isn't a secret ingredient to get in a perfect slow cooked piece of meat without slow cooking that piece of meat, you know, and every location is going to be a little bit different. People have their different seasoning, you know, depending on the kind of fire you use, it'll be different woods, different smells, you know, different environments require different temperatures. It's a unique thing and we need to own that as artists. And I use artists in a very sort of general term because in a sense we all are. So again, texture, adding texture to it. I know before I wrote mine, I literally, I had a feel of what I wanted it to be. And even before the message of the book, and then before I wrote a, wrote a single word, I drew, I, I researched little fairy tale things and woodland things because that's the theme and just drew pictures and I turned a conker into a drumstick and just drew all these pictures and then I got my feel of my book, what I wanted it to look like, got that love and then wrote it. That's great. Very good. Yeah, it's the best way. It's the best way to go. Nothing like a slow cooked novel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of what my wife likes to joke about. She says, you know, I, I, I keep trying to make something from scratch, but I can't find the scratch aisle at the supermarket. So, <laughs> 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 No, it doesn't quite work that way. Well, what does work this way is having a beautiful interview with you, Matthew, and, and learning more about your creative process. Now, Beyond the Pale has been out, you said, for about a year. I presume it's available in all the usual outlets. Is that right? Yeah, you should be able to get it online. Um, it's all linked to uh, beyondbook.co. And on there, you can read the first few chapters for free to get a sense of whether it's a book you'd like to commit to. And then, yeah, the links to Amazon, it's available, paperback, audio book, Kindle. And yeah, explore, see whether it's the, the next book on your to do to -do read list. I'm probably going to get an email or two from, because some of our readers like to avoid the larger Amazon, Barnes & Noble type chain stores. So is it available in the smaller bookstores as well? Um, it should be, but little secret hack that not everybody knows about. If um, you go to your local bookstore and it's not in there, like even save yourself time, just go to the front desk and ask if they have Beyond the Pale, they'll be able to like check in seconds. And if not, they can order it in and usually it can be delivered to their store in like a few days. Ah, so there you go. Yeah. I, it's something I didn't know until I started writing and I was like, wow, you can just go into like your library or your bookstore. And if they don't have it, you can just ask them to order it. And it's all done rather quickly these days. So yeah, it should, if it's not stopped in your local bookstore, they should be able to get it within a few days. Beautiful. I love it. And, uh, well, this has been a wonderful opportunity to kind of peer into the mind of Matthew Turner and find out how it works. And, and it's been fascinating. This has been cool seeing how your creative process works and how you're able to express it to us. So thank you for expressing it to us. That's first of all, that's the most important thing because it's not easy to express creative process. And thank you for what you're doing with, this is your fifth book, right? And in, in that right? You have five books so far. Yes. That's right. Wow. That's great. Is there a sixth one coming? I, I just kind of have to ask. Yeah, so Beyond the Pale, this is the first of a trilogy. So the second book, Beyond the Horizon, is still very much in my head. Ah. I'm in the early stages of, allow, as you say, the slow-cooked novel. is. Um, <laughs> I'm in the early stage of chopping. Uh, I'm not even ready to season yet. But yeah, the the we still have the cutting board good. out. Yeah, He's getting the trilogy. ingredients ready. That's right, I've got, yes. I've got like a little towel over my, my shoulder. You know, there, 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 the apron is still on, yeah. I'm, I'm busy. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, thank you very much for taking the time and, and sharing with us how your process works. We really do appreciate it. Oh, and Emery, appreciate you as well. And, and I'm glad we actually got to talk about one of your things that we don't talk about the writing so much. We got to talk about writing with you. That's good. I know. And it was just beautiful, wasn't it? Just beautiful. It was. I loved it. 
Yeah, fabulous stuff. So thank you guys much. Thank you, podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. 